how to start on the other foot. Except this one I'm going to really, really, really inject. I injected this one as I went along. I'm going to try and totally inject this one before I even start skinning it. Until next time, ta-ta. All right, I've got the other foot freed. Uh, I did, if you want to call it mess up just a little bit, I didn't go as far down to the last joint as I could have, as I did on the opposite foot, but that's okay. I will retrieve that bone during the, uh, when I finish skinning, and uh, I will just simply reattach it to the, the foot. But uh, I did a lot of injecting on this side that I, even more than I did on the first one. But now I'm skinning down the abdomen and I'm going to proceed to next open the tail. I'm going to open the tail next. What I need to do first is to pull back the area with the oil glands. Now this, I put this in a refrigerator overnight and this really firmed up quite a bit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the skin away. I'm going to cut through the, uh, the fatty tissue. I'm going to cut that away. I've got to move his package out of the way, speaking of out of the way. And I'm simply going to start to work around the base of the tailbone. Like I said, skinning is a sloppy thing, so it, it ain't pretty. But it's a job that has to be done, especially for a taxidermist. Now what I'm going to do, normally I like to get a blade in under the tail and work it forward with the blade up. But what I'm, I'm going to do a little something different here. I'm going to take my sprayer of Kimmel 4 and a brush. And I'm going to create a path down the center of the tail that I can get onto with my scalpel blade and open up. I'm going to brush it first. I'm going to brush it aside, the hair, the fur, and I'm going to create a path for the scalpel blade so I cut as little of the downy under undercoat and as possible. And to do possible. this I've got both brass bristle brushes and a steel bristle brush. And I, I just want to get it as straight as I possibly can on either side. This brush is kind of beat up a little bit. So let, let me go with my steel brush. I could probably get it. Yeah, I can get in there a lot better. Let me spray that. Tap that in so that it gets all the way down to the downy undercoat. And come along. So I can open this up without cutting away too many hairs, if any. I want to try and avoid cutting all hairs. Now I'm going to run down this with the tip of the forceps and I'm going to go under the hairs that are kind of like matted down or wetted down and I'm going to kind of push them aside a little bit. Okay? I'm going to just get under them and get underneath them and push them aside. I want to create a nice straight line on either side. Sometimes the brushing alone won't do it and it works. It, it helps if you go and work it with your fingers and a, a tool such as this forceps also known as a tweezers. I'm basically tweezing the hair out of the way. Now I want to get all the way up to where I want to start. I'm going to get my scalpel and I'm going to start making my incision. I'll put my fingers on either side. I'm going to begin my cut. Like so. And I'm going to go all the way down. I'm going to have to replace the blade. This blade worked on a foot and it's a little dull already. See how thick their, you can see how thick their tail skin is right here. Very, 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 very thick. Yeah, the tip of this blade is rather dull, but the base of the blade, the, the bulk of the blade is nice. It's sharp. I grab a little corner here. And I start to work it away with the blade, the scalpel blade, like so. And rather than cut against the skin, I'm cutting down into this fibrous tissue. Now it's not really so much fat as it is kind of a gristly, 
uh, a, a grisly tissue. It's pretty tough. Um, I had mentioned that this is, uh, they use their tail as a rudder, and they do, but they also use their tail for propulsion through the water. This tail is powerful, okay? See how flat it is. This tail, they get a couple of, wha a couple of whips under the water with this tail, and they're, they're gone. They're moving. They're moving real super, 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 super fast. Super fast. It's like super fly, but super fast. Superstar. Okay, I'm going to continue on with the scalpel. It's hard to get, I'm having a hard time putting an edge on that blade. Cut through this uh, cartilage. It's very, 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 very thick cartilage in the tail. I try to keep as much of it attached to the tail meat as I possibly can. Now I'm going to start on the other side. Very little hair has been has been cut. I mean, once it's stitched up and the tail is on the ground, as it will be in this mount, even if the tail was lifted in the air, it's so thick that when you brush it back, it'll be fine. It's not going to show. Now, like so. We go like so. I'm keeping as much of the gristle attached to the tailbone structure and its meat as I possibly, possibly can. Now this otter, a big male, they don't, they don't really have a terribly awful smell. Now, if you have a female that has fully developed mammary glands and she's had pups, there is a possibility that if she has milk in those mammary glands still, that will go sour. That will give you a terrible, terrible smell. Smell of a sour, you know, sour smelling kind of creamy otter milk. All right. I'm going to continue on all the way down to the tip of this tail. I'm going to do the same process all the way down. And when I come back on camera, I'm going to be going around the back of the tail stripping it up, uh, stripping the, the, the tail bone out, and then hanging him up by the hooks uh, I have hanging. I'm going to put them through the, uh, the Achilles tendon, the Achilles heel. Okay, I've taken my um, boning knife, and I've decided to go down the length of the tail with this. I've gone underneath. I so the camera can pick this up. I hope I'm not in the way. I'm in the way. Darn it. I'm left-handed. Let me try and do this right-handed and not ruin my the otter's tail. Pick it up, and I let the blade run under the skin. Let's get in close so you can see what's happening here. You can see this. The blade is under the under the skin. Okay. What I do now to get it along, I hold the tail down, lift up on the blade splits the tail. I go a little further down again. Make sure I'm holding everything. Make sure the tail is staying straight, that it's not going off to the side. Let me move this otter up so you can see this a little more. One chubby fella, up you go. Up you go, big guy. Come on, move along, move along, little fella. Oh, boy. Okay, let's get some big towel on his face there. A little bloody nose happening. There we go. All right. Okay, I want to keep the tail straight. We keep going. What I'm doing, I'm, I'm lifting away from the bone with the tip, with a blade, the edge of the knife, as I'm inserting it down. I'm not going too far down at one time. I want to hold the tailbone down, lift up on the knife, thus splitting the skin. I'm going to do this all the way down to the tip very, 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 very carefully. The closer you get to the tip, the more careful you need to be with this. Otherwise, you can end up just tearing the tip of the, uh, the tail clean off, and you don't want to do that. You do not want to do that. This guy's got a long tail. This, this will take a little while. Uh, see, now it's starting to go off, off center. You want to hold it so that it goes down the center carefully. Make this a careful, deliberate cut. Make sure your blade is riding along the bottom side of the bone that you haven't gone through to the top. 
you don't want to create a, a hole in the top of the tail skin. Okay. Go along. Uh, Trapper's suppliers have got a neat little, they have a tail guide that you get down in the tail and you put a real super thin knife. And I've got several more of these animals to do, as well as a gray fox and whatnot. And uh, I may invest in one of those little skinning systems. It may be a good idea to have one of those around. I hadn't taken a small game for a lot of years, so taking one in now, or getting a, this proper kind of cutting implements now, I think would be a good thing. So I've got a few of them in to do this year. All right, and you see how nicely that opens up? I have more to go. End of the tailbone is down here. I may try and slip the bone out in a little while. We'll see what happens. But in the meantime, I'm just going to keep, I'm going to continue cutting the skin away, or paring, I should say, paring the skin away from the tailbone the entire length as I go. You can see me doing here right now. Okay? I'm just going to continue that until I get to the end, and then we're going to get the uh, tip of the tail out of the skin. All right, it looks like I won't be pulling the tip of the tail out. You can see here, this is very, very dry. And if I was to pull this out, try to pull the tail tip out, I guarantee I would end up tearing the tip of the tail off or breaking the bone and leaving the tip inside and have to carve out a small section without any anchor point that I could grab. So this is going to be literally skinned and carved out all the way down to the very, very tip. It's very, very dry. This would be another area to soak down, wrap with wet cotton, wrap with a piece of paper towel, and then freeze it, as well as the face and the feet and whatnot. Um, yeah, this is very dry, very grease burned as well as just freeze dried. Has a, quite a bit of grease burn in there. So, I'm going to continue on. Well, I got as far down the tail as I dared without ripping the very tip of the tail off. There's perhaps one last bone joint in there. And I think I'll, I'll remove that after it comes back from being tanned, after it goes through the pickling and the tanning and the... Um, if the skin moistens up enough, and it should, it should, uh, because th this will be scraped. I have a tail scraper, a uh, tail scraping tool, actually for scraping tails. I will scrape down, uh, break up the fibers on this tail skin so that it does break down, and I, I will be able to salt that, and it will soften up during the pickling and tanning process. I'll be able to get it out at a later time. What I'm doing now, I'm continuing. I've got the otter rolled on his side so I can, I can continue to extract the tail bone and gristle from the skin. And I'm going along, I'm going through one side, from one side to the other. I try to come in from the other side and it's just making matters more difficult than it needs to be. It does not need to be this difficult. But um, I'm glad I was able to get that little tail tip finally extracted the way I did, as much as I did. I'm, I'm happy with the results, but in the meantime, I'm going to continue on here to get this tail skinned all the way around, and this is working well, and you can see I've got all the heavy stuff really, the heaviest, nastiest gristle and fat is left on the tailbone, and that's where I want it, that's where I want it. I'll tell you, it's not gonna, it's not, I'm not gonna need a lot of soapy release agent uh, for the plaster mold on this guy. Here's a little grease ball. Here's a little grease ball here. I've almost got him almost completely separated from his tailbone. It's just a very, very slippery little guy. You pull him over a little more. There we go. I'll continue on like so. Um, like I say, I'm basically I'm carving him out of here, carving the tail out of the tail skin, 
and it's working pretty well here. It's going along pretty well. Here we are. There we are. Very gristly, very greasy. Greasy, grimy, glumpy, gloomy. And like so. Now let's see where he is here. Okay. This big little strip of fat will come off another time. Alright. I'm going to go ahead and get this, scrape this off from this side now. Uh, like so. Oops. Hold it down. I don't want to cut the skin for sure. I don't do not want to cut the skin. Now this is a real tenderness attachment here. Right here. That's a that's a tough attachment point. And I'm just trying to get past all of it and get by it and get through it and around it. There we go. Let's roll them over on this side. Ah, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. There we are. That's all freed up now. Nice, nice. Like I say, we got some grease burn on the very tip of this tail. That's what this is. That's grease burn from a freezer. Drying them out. I'm going to get up and around his hips now and around his back. The lower end of his spine. Oops. Slippery, 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 slippery here. Just slapping things everywhere. up on the hooks and the next thing I'll be doing is stripping the skin down the body while he's hanging upside down always fun okay I've gone and hung the guy up on the uh, skinning gambrel I just didn't I decided to not put the hooks through the hocks I'd rather not tear into the flesh of the carcass that I'm going to use to make a mold of later so I used a couple of uh, zip ties to hook him up I may have to reapply this one here it's, it seems to be just a little loose I'll put a second one in its place. But there we have it so far, and here he is hanging like a dead monkey or a dead otter. So I'm going to continue the skinning. Right. Go up here and start skinning them down. Now, this red muscle tissue here, this is part of that flap. That extends from the hind leg. It's also called the flank skin, at least in horse world. I call it the flank skin for all other uh, mammals as well. But it is that flap of the hind leg that extends from the hind leg to the side of the body. And it's something I want to go ahead and try and keep on the carcass as much as I can. Like I said, I could just go and uh, go ahead and tear this thing down the way they do when they skin for fur, but I'm not doing that. I'm skinning for taxidermy purposes. I have paper towel on the table beneath his face to catch any uh, fluids and blood that drips from his nose. Even though I plugged it, that's since become saturated and he's, he's just dripping again. He's filled with the juices of life in death. He's filled with the juices of life in death. Poor old guy. All right, here we are. Going down the belly. 
Again, I want to keep as much uh, tissue on the carcass as possible and off the skin. Now I'm approaching the attachment point of the penis and this is a lot of the extraneous matter around the interior surrounding the sheath of the penis and I'm just carefully dissecting this away going underneath with the knife and coming through go with another knife and try and get in there. Now I will admit because this has taken, I've been recording this, it's been taking me a little longer than I normally would to just get in here and skin this thing. Because I'm explaining to you what it is I'm doing. So luckily I've got a nice big shop fridge that I keep turned way up. Or I, tur I keep the temperature turned way down, I should say. So I'm able to put him back in the fridge overnight. Normally I wouldn't have to. Normally I'd get this thing skinned in a couple of hours. But like I say, doing the video for my viewers, I want to make sure you get to see every little thing as it's happening. About the only thing here I didn't show was me hanging him up on the uh, skinning gambrel because I'm an old man and I have to use a mounting block to get up on air and to get him hung up and it's embarrassing so I'll keep my embarrassment to myself. <laughs> now I'm checking the outside to see where we're at. Okay we're past the penis here so I'm gonna go ahead and go under this bit of tissue. I'm going to go forward and I'm going to cut it loose. And try not to get squirted in the face. There we go. I really do love river otters. I think they're an amazing animal. Emil Liars, who, a gentleman from Minnesota who raised otters, kind of like the way I did with my pet squirrels, where he would take them around the various groups and organizations and, and have kids come and visit, and um, he would explain to them about the life of the otters. It's kind of like what I did with my squirrels for a while when I would bring them to a uh, convention and do a seminar on, on the gray squirrel. I had my little, my little babies there to show what a live squirrel was like. And there are guys who attended my seminar who can attest to how much fun it was towards the end when I would let Elliot, our male squirrel, who was everyone's friend, by the way, he would run around and jump from one person to another uh, he would sit on people's hats and on their heads and on their shoulders and they would give him little snacks to eat, little nuts and crackers and whatnot. And everyone had a ball when Elliot was in the room. He was everybody's friend. And I got to tell you, I do miss having those little critters around. I do miss having my little babies around. I really do. There are people who ask if I still have them and I'm like, no man, it's been like a little over 30 years, I think. <laughs> Close to 30 years. Squirrels don't live that long, even in captivity. But uh, this gentleman, Emil Liars, is Emil, E-M-I-L, which was my grandfather's name, by the way, my mother's dad. And his last name, Liars, or Lears, L-I-E-R-S, he became very well known for his 
the wildlife that he kept. He started as a hunter and a trapper and uh, came upon a female otter drowned in a trap one day and uh, there were three pups that were clamoring around their dead mother and he had an epiphany that day and decided he no longer wanted to kill animals. He no longer wanted to kill the animals, the otters, the muskrats, beavers. So he began to, he brought them home and he raised them, he nursed them, and he became their, uh, their, uh, their advocate for their wild cousins. He wrote many books. I just purchased one, it's called An Otter's Story. Uh, it's a it's a children's story and I'll tell you if you've ever seen any of the Dis Disney live action movies like Charlie the Lonesome Cougar or the Yellowstone Bear Cubs and you ever heard their narrator Rex Allen narrate the stories well I'll tell you as I've been reading this book every paragraph I read is in Rex Allen's voice well the little otters Realized that without mama, they would be in trouble. So they headed back to the den. Lickety split. I mean, that's the kind of, that, that, that's what I hear. <laughs> but uh, he was also a uh, technical advisor on some of the Disney live action movies. Uh, they did one that he was responsible for. It was called Flash the Teenage Otter. Uh, he was also responsible for, oh, I think he had something to do with Yellowstone Cubs. And he was, he was a technical, technical advisor and supplied a lot of the wild animals for the, 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 live, the live action, the, the live nature movies that they did, Disney Studios did. Here we go. And now we're down. Anyway, I don't tear the skin away the way they do for a, the way a trapper does for the hide. Especially when I'm looking to preserve the integrity of the carcass. The first two mannequins I'm going to sculpt, I'm going to use carcass casts as my base. The one is the pose that I showed in the earlier video, I'll show it again. Uh, I see Otter standing on all fours with the belly and the hind legs against the ground at the front end slightly elevated. And I'm going to do more otters laying on their back. I have different size otters to work now, to work with. So I'm gonna do different size otters laying on their back. That was a popular happy pose with a lot of people. And this time I think uh, it'll be done in rigid foam, not flexible foam. A little easier to, a little more familiar for folks to work with rigid foam than flexible foam. Now here I'm using uh, simply my 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 one uh, curved edge paring knife is not the bird's beak paring knife it's just a nice curved edge paring knife and it's allowing me to get in the way the scalpel did on the other parts it's not as sharp as the scalpel which is good because I don't want to cut into the abdomen and let the viscera come running out you know his innards I'm going to continue on until I reach the front legs and we'll come back on camera when I get there. All right, I've just come past what looks like an injury here on his chest. At first I thought it might have been a bullet hole. I don't know what this is. Uh, he might have gotten this from a fight with another otter. Could have fought with a coyote for all I know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if this animal was drowned in the conor bear trap, if it was a conor bear and he drowned, I don't know. Uh, or if he was shot, I don't know. 
I don't think he was clubbed. His skull feels intact from the outside. Of course, as Ducky on NCIS used to say, I won't know for certain until I get him on the table. Well, he's still hanging, so he's not really quite legitimately on the table. But when, I, when I reach his head, I'll know exactly what the injury is. Where I'm at now, I'm approaching uh, the, the skin flaps that uh, connect the forelegs to the body. I'm approaching the elbows of the forelegs, his stubby little forelegs. So I'm going to continue on. I just wanted to point that out. You, you, you get these things every now and again. You get injuries and whatnot, or wounds, and you find them, and you deal with them. This feature is uh, generally lost on the carcass. It's generally lost when these things are uh, trapper skinned. All they want to do, all they're concerned with is getting the skin off the, off the body, getting it on the beam, and then all this red meat would come off. It would all be beamed off uh, with a flushing, flushing knife. That's a difference. Now this, I'm concerned with the high, yes, but I'm also concerned with the animal's anatomy. That's one of my concerns, the animal's anatomy. So I want to keep these details intact on the carcass. To me these are important and I treat them as such and I there's very little on this skin right now. There's very little. There's just a layer of grease. This is going to be easy to flesh. This is not going to be tough to flesh at all. Okay? There's just a little layer of grease. No red meat. None really to speak of. Onward. Onward. Right now, I'm approaching the elbows. Here are the elbows. You can see that's the foreleg bending right there. Let me pull back a little bit. You see the, fore, the foreleg, the elbow. The shoulder blades or scapula are up here. This is the, the biceps and triceps of the forearm. There's the point of the elbow. And here's the skin that attaches to that. Now in the water, when they, when they put their legs out to turn in the water, you see what, what this does? This creates kind of a, a rudder action, all right, for the animal. Now all animals have this, this flap of skin to some extent. Others have it more than, uh, uh, some, animal, some mammals have it more than others. It's most exaggerated in the flying squirrel where it runs from the elbow down to the knees of the hind leg. Woohoo! Now, uh, another reason for leaving as much of the meat tissue, the muscle tissue, intact on the carcass. You recall earlier I said I wanted to check my measurements that I took through the skin, through the fur. I wanted to check them against the skinned carcass. Make sure that they're true. Now sometimes you, when, when the animal has got a coat as fine as that of a river otter, you can use the measurements taken from the exterior, taken from the fur side. The reason is, again, you're measuring a dead animal. So the little bit of, the little bit of, of uh, extra that you get, which is millimeters at best, simply uh, compensates for the, pack, for the fact that it is, in fact, a dead animal. All right? It compensates for that. And it gives you a little, uh, somewhat closer to a live, plump, living animal that's got blood pressure and blood coursing through its veins and whatnot. Uh, so it's not that the measurements will be changed. They will be noted and marked probably with a letter C for carcass or C-A-R what have you. Uh, okay, I'm going to continue on down until I get past the forelegs and start on the uh, front paws. One more thing for the viewers watching, uh, whatever mammal you're skinning, you can detach the forelegs from the carcass at this point and be able to skin them out later while it's laying on the, on the table. 
Me, I'm choosing to do things the hard way. <laughs> I'm going to keep the carcass intact. I want to make carcass tracings. I want to take a photographic record, measurements, and then, of course, uh, some molds of the carcass. That's why I'm leaving everything attached and leaving as much meat as possible intact on the carcass. You, the viewer, you don't have to. You have an otter, you want to get it skinned, you can cut the legs off the carcass and continue on. Carry on. Okay, we've gone through one foreleg at the elbow, exposed through here. Continue on down. Put an edge on my knife again. I'm going to go through this side as well. Yeah, just like so. There we go. Opened it right up. Put my finger through and pull a little bit. And pull and cut the connective tissue. Now, I do notice something on this. This is his left foreleg. Yeah, his left foreleg here. He's got what looks like a little freezer, freezer burn going on here. See how dark this is in comparison with the other? This looks like what we had going on with the tail. So, I just want to be sure that I'd be very, very careful as I skin down this arm. Oh, I'll tell you what it is. He's got a broken bone. He's got a broken bone. Yeah. This leg bone is fractured. And I'm stupid enough to hold the knife upside down. Great. All right, so I want to be careful. I want to make sure that there's no compounding to this fracture. In other words, I want to make sure that the bone didn't exit the skin anywhere. Now, I didn't see anything on the outside of the otter, and I did handle him all around. But you still want to be careful. And it seems like a carcass, a carcass cast would be a good, a good idea for this particular specimen with the broken leg. Don't know if it broke during the trapping or if he's been running around with a broken leg. I can tell you that the amount of discoloration tells me he was alive for a while with this broken leg. So God knows how he broke how he broke it. Or should I say, Gaia knows how he broke it. Pardon my elbow. Let me get this this side, this leg here, now, this foreleg, the right one. But there is a little freezer burn on this area as well. That is a little freezer burn right there. Now I'll continue on and come back when there's uh, something significant to show. Okay, we're on the four legs. We're coming down to the hands, or the, the front, the four paws. And I've gone past the break and there are no, there are no holes in the skin so it was not a compound fracture still not sure how we could have broken his his arm but could be the trap probably is that's how he was he was he was trapped he was a trapped animal all right what I'm doing now is I'm coming upon oh they're equivalent of our thumb so there's oops you can't see that Okay, well, on the left paw, 
there will be a first digit. And that's what we're coming to now. And I want to go carefully here. I don't want to pop through the skin. Again, it's just like the hind foot. I want to go as far down the toe as I can. I'm not going to try and turn the foot right side out to see where I'm at. I know where I'm at, but uh, I'm just not going to try and do that now. There's because in this instance, there's a whole a whole lot of otter <laughs> to have to turn. And I'll be going against gravity, so I'm not going to be doing that. This is where you want to be careful. I've already put my hair against this guy's belly twice. <laughs> oh, jeez. Pardon me while I juice this up. I've got my coffee. Mm-hmm. I've been doing this for 53 years, doesn't bother me none. And very, 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 very carefully here. I'm going to go as far down the digit as I can. Just like with the hind feet, I want to go all the way down to the last joint. The first phalange, that's what the toe bones are called, phalanges. I want to go down to the first phalange that contains the claw. And that's the bone that will stay in the toes. If you take that out, you will remove the claw from the, from the skin and that's not what I want to do. Freezer turned on. I know the freezers are working. One of the three turned on. Sounds like the old one. Okay, it's going along pretty good right here. Here's a little freezer burn, just like the hind feet. A little freezer dry. Not freeze dried, freezer dried. The dry air of the freezer sucks the moisture right out of these digits, these toes, these fingers. Makes them exceptionally dry. Oh, it feels like I'm at the point of no return. No. <laughs> Okay, I've injected the toes. You can see they're kind of fluid filled looking because they are. I did inject into the toes. So, let me grab hold of my leather man and try and expose this joint like I did on the hind foot. And I think there it is. Okay, it appears that the Last joint that I that I want to I want to have out is right here. It's right here. So I need to dig my knife blade into there and walk that joint out. I'm also going to disconnect a lot of this connective tissue. Now uh, the connective tissue. There are, there is webbing between the front toes as well, as there was with the hind. <laughs> Just so you know, we're dealing with a fully aquatic mammal. Semi-aquatic, but really aquatic. The water lover. The way my cats are, su uh, sun worshippers, river otters are water lovers. They're water babies. Water babies. Now we pull down a little more. I'm trying to expose as much around the entire foot so that the smallest toe can come away 
easily. And what injecting does, that basically just softens the skin for the moment. Ahead of that, it's still pretty darn dry. But I'm going to dis disarticulate this joint right now. Getting in there with the tip of the knife blade. I want to cut the joint without cutting the skin, as I said, regarding the hind legs. Let me see if I can pull this loose with the uh, pliers of my Leatherman multi-tool. Uh, those tendons, they hold on real well. I'm just going to have to keep working it. I got the theme from Gladiator, the music from Gladiator running in my head. I have a radio brain. Aha, here we go, here we come. All right, right here, let me see if I can focus this for you. Right here is the joint. Right there, right where my, the tip of my thumb is pointing. That is the joint. So I'm going to try and get this undone. on camera toot sweet sweet quick uh, I'm gonna try <laughs> I'm gonna get it undone I'd like to get it undone on camera now try and turn this so you guys can see it let's go into the other side there we go oh there we are isn't that lovely all right I'm gonna try and cut this without cutting the skin there's one tendon in there, another tendon coming away, there we go, there it is. That's the equivalent of the otter's thumb, whoops, that's the thumb right there, small finger. I'm going to go down and continue on and free up the rest of the fingers bearing in mind there is webbing between the toes okay there is webbing between the fingers just like on the hind feet I think that may that may be contributing to what's why these feet are as dry as they are there's a lot of skin on the surface of an otter's foot a lot and that webbing I think has got a lot to do with it well now that you saw one toe come free. I'm going to take the other toes off. I'm going to disarticulate the rest of the toes off camera. This way I can concentrate on what the hell I'm doing. All right, and just as with the hind foot, I'm down to the last toe, his middle finger. Oh boy, he's giving me the finger. There's been a lot of injecting, a lot of working with the pliers, the long nose pliers on my Leatherman tool, and a lot of cutting of tendons a lot of digging in so I, I don't want to cut the skin that's the problem I don't want to cut the skin I do want to disart, de -art, disarticulate this toe whenever I bend back expose some tendons I do manage to bring them to the point where I can cut some more and dig the knife tip in the biggest thing to be careful of is not to stab your finger easy enough to do I always keep band-aids in my top shirt pocket or the pocket of my lab coat easy access I don't worry about having a box of band-aids out here 
Okay. Here are the tendons on the top. You're not getting that. Well, it's tough because I'm left-handed. So let me try and do this bass backwards. All right, let's see. This here, dig in there. I think I'm getting it loose now. I'm gonna go ahead and bring in a scalpel blade, and this is gonna be a little tricky, but I think the scalpel blade will get in there a little easier. It's got a little finer point than the uh, the knife. Like so, and like so. I'm going to kind of twist it loose. Grab the bone with the pliers. Twist the foot in my hand with my hand. Try and twist that joint loose. Two different directions. It's also a little greasy, which makes it a little difficult. And grow them in a paper towel. And here we go. We got it now. There we go. All right. That's down to the last joint. Don't know how well you were able to see that, if at all, but that is down to the last joint now. All but, I think, this toe. I don't know. I'd have to look on the outside of the foot. I'd have to look at the foot on right side out. There might uh, this this bone here broke a little bit. This toe bone, you can see where it broke off a little bit. The two center toes are the same length. I got to do the other foot now, and then we'll proceed to the head. Okay, the toes on the opposite foot here, which uh, they are just so hard and, 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 and from being dry that there are bones left in the skin. You can see the difference between the two feet here. Okay. It's, uh, I stopped trying to dig because it's taking too much time. So now I'm going to go ahead. <clears throat> I'm going to run down the, down the head.